It's close enough to seven. We have like five seconds left. I'm turning off my alarm. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Apoxum, and you are here, I hope, for an introduction to vending at mostly furry conventions. Uh, before I get started, I know there's a little disclaimer at the bottom about filming. For everybody other than Cody, Cody is allowed to do this. Everybody else, you're welcome to film if you would like for personal use. Uh, I just ask that you don't upload it to social media or YouTube. Again, Cody, you're good. Uh, before I really get started, again, hello, hi, I am a Poxon. You can find me in the dealer's den at Anthro Northwest um, and a lot of other dealer's dens uh, throughout the year. In my uh, day life, day job, I am a teacher, so uh, I feel like between that and the 20 plus conventions that I have vended at, I have a pretty good understanding of the ins and outs of what's required, especially getting started, so that is why I feel comfortable talking to y'all today about this. Um, oh, actually, one other thing. Uh, if you're needing to go to another panel, if you find this isn't for you or you're bored, totally fine. I will not be hurt if you get up and need to head out totally fine, not a problem. Don't feel like you have to stay if this isn't for you. So, have you started your own furry business? Are you looking to vend at a convention? Are you thinking of vending at a convention as a gateway to starting up a full-time furry business? Or are you interested in vending at conventions as a once in a while activity? Either way, we're gonna go over what's involved. I mostly am going off of my PowerPoint here. Uh, the PowerPoint is also for accessibility issues, or uh, not issues, accessibility features. Um, and it will also be available online afterwards in case anybody wants to go back and see what has been talked about. So let's talk about getting started. There's a lot involved in vending at conventions, but don't let that stop you. Um, this will help you get an idea of what to think about. So first things first. Uh, make a list of the conventions that you would like to attend. On your list, it's a good idea to include the following. The dates of the convention. Their approximate attendance numbers. Uh, their table and registration prices. These are sometimes combined and sometimes separate. So just double check. Some conventions will be like the table price is 150 and reg is 70. Some of them will combine the two. It's a good idea to take note of that. Their application dates and deadlines. Most conventions have a window of time in which you can apply, and if you are trying to apply outside of that, unfortunately you can't because the form does not exist. So make sure you know when you'll need to be online to apply. Also consider your transportation logistics. How are you going to get there and how are you going to get home? And you're going to want to consider your estimated cost for the weekend, not the cost to uh, attend, but the entire cost of like getting there and the hotel and the table and your food and so on. And we will go over this in detail. So starting off, the dates. Things to consider with the dates. Are you able to take this time off of work? Are you able to make or assemble or order enough merchandise in this time frame? This is especially important if the conventions that you are attending are close together. For example, I'm going to use a couple personal examples throughout this. Hopefully, we won't get too derailed here. But for example, um, between the beginning of November and now, I have vended at the LFC, Halloween, Midwest Fur Fest, and Anthro Northwest. That is just over two months in order to make merchandise for four conventions. That was very difficult and I needed to know ahead of time how much time I needed in order to prepare that merchandise. If I hadn't been on it, I would not have had a table display. I wouldn't have anything on it. So, making sure you have enough time to make your merchandise is very important. Attendance numbers. This isn't like a be all end all, but it's something important to keep in mind. So, smaller conventions mean that you will have fewer sales opportunities but they can be a great starting off point. Larger conventions typically see a lot more applications because uh, there are more sales opportunities. Larger cons also tend to have uh, more competition, again, because there are more applicants. Um, so often I would recommend, always, I would recommend starting off small. Table and registration prices. So they're typically due within a few weeks of your application's approval. This can be months and months before the convention. 
Ideally, if you're a vendor like me and you like a lot of notice ahead of time, it's going to be three to six months ahead of time. So can you foot that bill up front and then wait to make that money back for those uh, extra months between when you've paid for your table and when you've actually made the money to pay it back? Why is the floor sticky? It's fine. Uh, so application dates. Uh, applications are generally juried these days. That means that there will be like 100 applications. The dealer's den leads and con staff will go through them. They'll have a list of criteria they don't necessarily make public, but they will look through it and see, okay, this person's stuff looks really interesting. This person's stuff uh, is not quite as professional. Um, we have three dozen um, artists selling fursuits. Maybe we want fewer than three dozen artists in the dealer's den selling fursuits. So they're doing a bunch of things. They're trying to make sure there's a variety in the dealer's den, and they're trying to make sure that the variety that they have is going to appeal to a wide audience. So that's what I mean when I say jury. Now, application windows, because they are not first come, first serve, can still be quite short. You can have between 24 and 48 hours to apply. Some conventions give you two days to get that application in. So it is really important to double check when those dates are and make notes set a timer on your phone, whatever you need to do, so that you don't forget to apply. Transportation logistics. If you are lucky, you might live near a local convention. If you live in Northwestern America and want to vend at more than one convention, you are probably going to be traveling. We don't have a lot up here in the Pacific Northwest. But things you want to consider, how are you going to get there? Are you flying? Are you busing? Are you taking the train? Are you driving? Can you take public transit? And additionally, this is really important, how are you going to get your merchandise and set up there? If you are flying, you need to be able to bring everything, or almost everything, and we'll talk about that as well in the next slide. Not quite the next slide, we'll get there. So continuing on, I would say the easiest conventions to start vending at would be local something that is drivable, or something that you can take public transit to. A mid-tier difficulty would be something a little bit more long distance, something that's drivable in a single day, even if that single day is maybe like eight or 10 hours. It's drivable, it's okay. Hard mode would be something long distance, where you need several days to drive there, or you are busing there, or you are flying domestic. Challenge mode is flying international. Flying international involves figuring out if you're going to get your merchandise from A to B, whether or not you're allowed to get your merchandise and sell your merchandise in another country, uh, things like that. So starting local or local-ish is almost always best for another reason as well. You have the convenience of being close to home and in an area that you are probably somewhat familiar with. That way, especially starting off, if you've forgotten something or you need to go on a supply run, you have a better idea of what is available to you. You might have a better idea of public transit or you have a better idea of how to drive to get to the locations. You're not in a completely unfamiliar area. So I do recommend starting local. Transporting your setup and merchandise long distance for driving. Um, if you can transport everything, there's a couple different ways to do this. One, if you can transport everything in your own vehicle, that's the best, that is the best option. Um, but if you can't, your packing priorities matter. Because again, if you are going to a convention to vend, I hate to say it, but it is going to be more business focused than it is fun focused. So that means fun stuff like your fursuits, and your plushies that aren't for sale, uh, those might have to stay home if you can't fit them all in your vehicle. So your packing priorities should be your clothing and your personal necessities and your float, this is very important, your merchandise, your table setup, and then your fun stuff. I would actually almost swap the table setup for your merchandise because you could also consider shipping or mailing your merchandise. Um, also consider shipping or mailing anything that doesn't fit in your vehicle or perhaps having a friend bring it or uh, in the case of table setup, sometimes uh, it is worthwhile to just purchase it while you are at the convention, depending on how expensive it is going to be to get it there and get it back. So additionally, take extra care if you are packing things into either like one of those little behind the vehicle like luggage crates with a bin or anything like a thule container that goes on the top of your car, be very careful and make sure it is really secure. There have been horror stories about those things uh, blowing off the top of vehicles, especially on highways and stuff, and merchandise just being 
gone, gone to the wind. So be very careful if that is something you're going to do. Make sure it's attached and closed and locked. If you are flying, this is important. If the value of everything that you are bringing, particularly your merchandise, is over $2,000 approximately, and it gets lost, the airline only insures things up to $2,000. So that means if it gets lost, they'll give you two grand and that's it. So make sure uh, you know how much it's insured for and possibly consider mailing it. Or if not, make sure there is a tracker in your luggage. So that at the very least you can tell the airlines, hey, I know where my luggage is, it's here find it. Um, I would also recommend for packing priorities, again, your clothing, your personal uh, necessities, including your float, those should go in your carry-on. If you're flying with your merchandise, your merchandise should be your next priority, followed by table setup, and then fun stuff. If you plan on mailing your merchandise, uh, keep in mind that you want to use a carrier that will ensure your merch for the full amount because the same thing if that gets lost or it gets damaged and you have not insured it you are out of luck so it's very important if you are not going to mail your merchandise it should be your second priority when packing before your table setup this is sort of in between packing and in between the cost for the weekend this is the baggage fees section if you are flying on most airlines, not all, but most, you're going to pay a luggage fee and it's going to go up for every single bag you have. Um, there are also weight limits. It's usually about 50 pounds. There are sometimes bag limits as well. Um, and depending on the airport, that may be different and the time of year. So it's really important if you do plan on flying, you look up your airline's info, see how much the baggage fees are, make sure you know how many bags you can check and uh, make sure you know what their weight and size limit are because there are also size by volume limits for your luggage. That said, hockey bags and sports equipment bags fall outside of the regular bag volume limits. So you can mail a fursuit in a hockey, or sorry, fly with a fursuit in a hockey bag that is much larger than um, would be allowed if it was a suitcase. So keep that in mind for your merchandise. Generally, depending on what you have, um, it is cheaper to mail your merchandise if you need to check more than two bags. The first bag is usually 30, the second bag is between 40 and 50, and the third bag is 100. So once you're starting to get up in there, don't forget, those also have to come home with you. So you're doubling the baggage fees. It may be better off for you to mail it. Additionally, your carrier will probably, if it's UPS or FedEx, be able to insure you for the full amount where the airline might not be able to. So, TLDR from this, make sure you know your baggage fees, the baggage weight, and the number of bags uh, you can actually fly with. Also, I recommend if you're gonna get a suitcase, get one with wheels, just, and get ones with the 360 wheels, not just the, the regular rolly ones, 360 wheels, are so nice when you have a very heavy bag or two very heavy bags or two very heavy bags and a carry-on bag. So estimated cost for the weekend. This would be things like how much are the hotel rooms? How much will it cost you to get there? This could be gas. This could be the bus, the plane, the taxi, the ferry, parking fees, things like that. How much is it going to cost you to get your setup and your merchandise there? This is particularly uh, if you are shipping your merchandise uh, or if you are flying with it. How much is parking? For example, Anthro Northwest parking is approximately $25 a day. Some cons have it for free. Some cons have it $50 or more. Make sure you know. And how much will you need to spend on food for the weekend? If you are in a downtown core, the food available to you may be more expensive than if you are out closer to the airport. Um, so that is something to keep in mind as well. And if you are flying, you may not be able to go to a Walmart and pick up PB&J. So. The application process. We talked about how uh, conventions you need to apply and they are juried. There is usually an application form what should you expect on this application form? Most applications will ask you to provide the following. A brief description of what you plan to sell. They will want a link to your gallery or examples of your work. Some conventions do not accept Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, things like that as a website or a gallery. 
So it may be worth your time either to invest in setting up a website of your own or have backups like Fur Affinity, Ink Bunny, DeviantArt, or Etsy. I will say Etsy with an asterisk because if you are like me and you only have one or two of each item available on Etsy or if you need to close your shop for some reason during that application time, the products that you have disappear. So you may not want to use Etsy as a gallery if that's something there's a risk of. So they will also ask you for examples of previous table setups. If this is your first time vending, that might be a little bit of a challenge. However, you can also either draw a mock-up or if you are really getting into it and you're investing in the setup already, you can make a mock-up setup. A lot of places will accept that as well. Um, they will also ask if you have any special requests. This is generally for the layout purposes of the dealer's den. So make sure you include things like accessibility. So for example, if you are uh, mobility impaired, you may want an extra space between tables so you can get your wheelchair in and out or if you need to use a cane, etc. Um, additionally, uh, consider things like who you would like to sit beside. Maybe you have a friend who's done this before or someone you trust. You're know, like, I really would like somebody, a friend who can help me through this. Can I please sit next to so-and-so? Or perhaps there's somebody you really don't get along with. You could say, please don't sit me next to them. Um, if they allow the option to request electricity, you might be able to request it. Or if you need to be near the washrooms or something, they might be able to accommodate you and put you near the doors. So things like that. They may also ask you for a temporary sales tax ID number. This is becoming a lot more common with conventions. Um, and some conventions will provide them for you. So if you are vending, let's say in Reno, uh, their state has a rule that the venue provides the application for their vendors. Other states do not, Texas, Washington, and so on. If you apply for these, also take note, sometimes they will require you to file every quarter, even if you make nothing. They're not gonna charge you for making nothing, but you do need to be on top of filing for it. Because if you're like me and you forget to file in Texas and your amount is zero for that quarter, they will still charge you $50 for a late fee. So make sure you file if that's on their rules. And make sure as well that you research ahead of time which conventions require these. A lot of times the application is online, super simple, but it can take a few weeks to go through. So you want to make sure that you have that ready to go when you apply. Because the application a lot of times will say, we will not accept you if you don't have this number. So make sure you know. Also, read through the convention's dealer's den rules to be sure your merchandise is appropriate for the convention that you are applying to. There are certain merchandise that is not acceptable at Anthro Northwest. You need to know that going in. That's the sort of thing. They will also often have a dealer's information packet that you can look through that will include things like, hey, this is what to expect with our particular application. These are all the things we're going to need from you beforehand. This is what we expect of your behavior and, and code of conduct in general at the convention. So make sure you scope it out beforehand. Is it worth it? Excuse me. Worth it means different things to different people. So networking with potential clients can be just as important as your weekend's sales figures. We're gonna be talking about worth your while as paying for the convention, your expenses, and the time it's taken you to make and or acquire your merchandise, as well as the time taken off of work in order to sell your merch. If you're running a small business, you probably already have an idea of how much you uh, net, so how much you make after all your deductions on your products. I also have a business panel on Sunday that I'll talk more about how to calculate this sort of thing if you want to come by that. Um, and I believe there are also several other panels throughout the weekend that also discuss running small businesses. So if this is something you're really interested in, I highly recommend checking those out as well. Um, so based on how much you make per item or item type, how much do you need to earn in order to pay yourself for the time you've taken off and the time uh, to, uh, sorry, time you've taken to make it and sell it. So also keep in mind that it is a sliding scale. The more hours it takes you to make your merchandise, the more money you invest into it, the more sales you're going to need to make in order to break even. Now, scheduling your time is also very important. Like I said, consider how much time it's going to take you to either make or acquire your merchandise. How close are the dates of the convention or conventions you'll be vending at? Do you have time to prepare enough merchandise? Like I said, I did a really um, intense stint of 
BLFC, Halloween, MFF, Anthro Northwest. I had to make sure I had enough time to make merchandise for all of these conventions and I needed to do that before I really got the ball rolling and went to any of these conventions. Before I said, yes, I would like to vend, here's my money for my table. I had to make sure I had enough time to make the merchandise to make it worthwhile. That was very important. Conventions are work, but uh, you should at least have a little bit of fun. Um, so don't, if you can help it, try not to work yourself to the bone before you go. Uh, exhausted husks are not fun. And if you're exhausted, your immune system takes a hit and you're more likely to get sick. You're more likely to get con crud, whatever. So again, try and make sure that you are rested before the con. Do not work yourself to death just to get here. It's not worth it. Planning your setup. So we talked a little bit about making a mock-up display. Think about what sort of hardware you're going to need for the specific convention and setup you want. This is particularly important if you are flying to a convention or traveling with limited space or weight. Think about and time yourself. How long is it going to take you to set up? Uh, setup can take for me personally, if you've seen my tables downstairs, it's the candy, candy shop one. Setup for me takes between three and four hours. So I want to make sure that I have enough time to do that. If I don't, there are some solutions like perhaps setting up part of it in the hotel room, carting it down and setting the rest of it up in the den when it opens for setup. But ha planning how long it's going to take you is very important. Part of this involves having a game plan before you get into the dealer's den. So the less time you spend fussing and figuring out, mm, should I do it this way? Should I do it that way? Uh, the better. Create a mock-up, figure out what you want, where you want it to go. It will make your life so much easier. It will make your setup go so much faster. Um, stress considerably less if you have a game plan. With that, we'll talk a little bit about the hardware and the general go-tos for hardware. Um, there are the standard wire or plastic sided storage cubes. These are an excellent starter. If you go into the dealer's den or the artist alley, these are the majority of what you are going to see, especially for folks with like a one or two table setup, the wire cubes or the plastic cubes. They are modular. That means you can rearrange them how you like. They're easy to transport and they display a wide variety of products. Go down to the dealer's den tomorrow, take a look around and see how people have them set up. See what sort of, what sort of things are possible with them. It's very cool. Um, the cons are that they can be heavy, especially the metal grates. They are basic. Uh, every, a lot of people use them. Um, and they're not mix and match. What I mean by they're not mix and match is that uh, if you buy two sets at two different times that are two different brands, those little clips that hold them together will not work or they may not work. And then you're stuck with two sets that you cannot interchange. So it's important to remember the brand that you ordered and order all of them either together or go with that brand. And if you need to order more, order more with that brand. Another option is plastic modular shelving units. Uh, I'm not sure how well you can see them up there, but uh, these are good for specific types of merchandise, perhaps clothing or um, uh, foam head blanks, things like that. The pros, they are modular, they are somewhat modular, they are easy to transport, and they're often lightweight. However, the cons can be, uh, depending on what they are, they may be too large to fly with, um, and also they don't have a back. A lot of them don't have a back, so if you have products that you wanna lean up against something, there's nothing for them to lean up against unless you uh, make something like an insert as well for that. So, personalizing your setup. The important part of personalizing your setup, the thing that you should focus most on is invest in a banner and business cards or QR codes. I forgot all my business cards. I frequently forget my business cards. I have little QR codes that I print out and stick on my table instead. Your banner and your business cards should include your name or your business's name, your logo if you have one, and links to your social media or your other contact information. Beyond that, designing is up to you. Honestly, all of this is up to you, but this is like, I highly recommend this. Um, the design, totally up to you. You will also want a toolkit. Toolkits are lovely. 
I love my toolkit. Make yourself a toolkit with everything you need or you think you might need. The basics usually include a power bank and a charge cable so that if your phone starts to die, you can charge it or if your square reader starts to die, same thing. Sharpies, note cards, tape, either masking tape or scotch tape, duct tape if you're hardcore, um, pens, bulldog or like those binder clips like, uh, like this of a variety of sizes. Um, safety pins are also very helpful. Zip ties are amazing and scissors are a must. You will also need, or I highly recommend, that you pick up transaction supplies. What I mean by this is something that will allow you to take card payments. You will notice a huge difference in sales if you are able to take card versus just cash. Personally, I would say 75% of my sales are by card. So you want to have the ability to take card where possible. You also want to have a float. Um, let's start with float. You want 100 to $150 in $1 to $20 increments. If you vend often or you're planning on vending often, consider separating that float at the end of your convention and keeping it set aside for the next one. Just keep it in your con box. That way when you have to go, you don't have to worry about, oh shoot, I forgot to go to the bank. I need to go and get change. It's just done. It's just done. It's easier. Now, like I mentioned, square readers are really, really important. You will absolutely lose sales if you cannot take card. ATMs last usually through Friday, maybe early Saturday before they run out of cash. And banks and the folks who, I guess, like throw money back in the ATMs, those people have the weekends off. So again, card reader, very important. There are several different types of card readers. There's the swipe ones at the top. Those are slowly being discontinued. So I would recommend going with the next step down, which is a little square reader. It's about yay big. If you've been in the dealer's den, you've probably seen them. You can tap or you can insert your card. Those are very helpful. Um, if you're planning on doing this long term, you may want something more like the square terminal. Those are in the couple hundred dollar range. Um, again, I would recommend that later on, not when you're starting off. Also worth noting, the square terminals require Wi-Fi whereas the little square readers do not. So if you're stuck somewhere that does not have Wi-Fi, um, you can still use your transactions. Now, with the square readers, it is also important to note that you need a bank account in the country you're vending in and in the currency you are accepting. They are region locked. That means if I take my American square reader and I go up to Canada and try to use it, I can log in but it will not let me take payment. Um, even if I, if I had a Canadian account, a Canadian bank account, and I take my Square Reader and I go up to Canada and I try to log in to my Canadian account on my Square Reader, it still will not let me take payment because the hardware itself says I can only be used in the United States. It's the hardware and your bank account together. So you need a bank account in the country you are taking currency in and you need um, a Square Reader that was purchased in the country you are taking payment in. If you're planning on selling abroad, um, personally, I don't have experience with this, but I have heard that Stripe works. Um, but again, I don't have experience with that, so we don't want to talk about it too much and uh, talk about something that I'm not familiar with. So let's talk about the bank. Make sure that you have a secure place to store your cash. Avoid cash boxes if you can. A cash box looks like a cash box. What does a cash box do? It holds money. They are easily stolen and they are easily targeted. You want to make sure to keep your cash attached to your body. This might be a money belt. This could be a fanny pack. Myself, I have a lovely apron that I wear and inside I have a little front pocket. I have a little pouch for my, my um, float and that pouch actually has a clip to the inside of my apron. So even if someone were to grab my money pouch and walk away with it, they would be taking me with them. So make sure you have a secure place for your cash and bring your cash up to your room nightly. Set aside your float and store the remaining cash in a safe location. Don't leave it sitting out. So theming your table, we talked a little bit about the basics for your table and your basic setup. Theming your table is fun. Um, consider doing this if you're planning on vending often. A fun setup is engaging, it will draw people in. However, theming is also an investment. 
And if you're just starting to dip your toes into this, it's okay if you don't wanna throw all of that money in there right away. You can build it up over time. For example, my table setup, this is from Vancouver last year. It took, it's taken me six or seven conventions to get my table set up to that point. And even now I'm tweaking it and I'm like, mm, I think I'm gonna buy this thing here and I'm gonna replace it with that and so on, right? So it does not have to be done all at once. Yeah. At the convention. Let's talk about setup. We talked a little bit about setup. We're gonna talk about the actual like going in and doing the setup. Arrive on time or early if you're okay with possibly waiting until the dealer's den doors open. Follow your dealer's den leads instructions. They're typically emailed out beforehand. They will let you know, hey, this is the time we're open. Um, you can expect, you know, here's the loading bay if you need it. Uh, please make sure to follow XYZ protocol when you come in. Keep in mind, setup can be very stressful. Uh, between time constraints, if you only have a couple hours to set up, uh, folks, a lot of folks have like pre-con jitters um, or anxiety about like, am I gonna make, am I gonna break even? Am I gonna break even? Um, do what you can to alleviate that stress beforehand. And one of those things is it will go easier if, like I said, you have a plan for your setup, even if it's rough to go off of. It's one less thing for you to worry about. Also keep in mind that the people around you may also be stressed out, anxious, etc. So try and be as considerate as possible to your neighbors. So we'll talk a little bit about the setup etiquette here. If you plan on playing music, keep it to a minimum or have headphones in. It's okay to walk around the dealer's den during setup. Generally speaking, nobody minds as long as you're not like getting in people's way or something, totally fine. However, do not attempt to purchase items from a vendor who is actively setting up. Um, it's usually okay to ask like, hey, I really like that. Would it be okay if you put that aside for me? I'm also a vendor and I will come by and get it later in the convention. Here's where my table is. They'll often say, yeah, I can do that. Okay, let's put it aside for you. That's okay. But actively trying to be like, hey, I see you're really busy. Can I throw money at you now? Mm -mm, please don't, please don't. Um, read the room. If a vendor looks busy while they're setting up, they may not want to visit. Uh, you could say hi and come back later. It's also okay to take a walk around the dealer's den, peruse, and check your prices to make sure that you're not overpricing or underpricing yourself or your colleagues. Just, you know, like, oh, okay, all right, um, those kigus are about this much. Oh, how much do I have mine priced? Okay, I should probably, you know, I minor, minor, I don't know, way too expensive. I need to lower them down. Mine aren't quite expensive enough. Okay, well, we'll adjust it that way. So, scam and theft prevention. Consider implementing the following to deter theft and scams. So if you've worked in, in uh, customer service or in retail, you're probably familiar with some of these. Uh, like I said, avoid cash boxes and keep cash on your person. Ensure that all easily grabbable item, items on your display are clamped down or have a single display item that folks can look at, they can pick up and handle, but keep the rest behind your table. Say you're selling enamel pins and you just have a bowl full, those are gonna disappear. Not all of them. One or two are just gonna kinda disappear at some point. So you may wanna have them stuck on a pin board, people can ask for them. That's what I talk about there. That's what I mean when I say grabbable items. Uh, put a sheet or some sort of drapery over your table when you're not there, even if the dealer's den is closed. Take a picture at, of the front and the back of your table before leaving each day. That way, if things look odd in the morning, you can compare them to the picture you took and see if things have been shuffled through and if things are missing. I say this, it probably sounds kind of sketchy. Things do not often go missing in the dealer's den after hours. It is extremely, extremely rare, but you do wanna make sure that you are taking precautions. Um, notify staff immediately if anything has gone missing. Uh, when you are accepting cash payment, keep the cash on the table while you count out your change. That way, uh, that old, well, no, I gave you, I gave you a 20, not a 10. Uh, that old scam, they can't do that because it's right there. Um, familiarize yourself with how to detect counterfeit bills, even the small ones. Perhaps consider investing in one of those little counterfeit pen testers that like you can draw a line um, on the bill and it'll 
show up a different color if it's fake, good idea. And never leave your cash in the dealer's den after hours. Actually selling. Actually selling is like a very small fraction of what is involved in vending at a dealer's con uh, at a furry convention. But we'll talk about selling. So in get engaging attendees with a smile and a nod, a hello, how's it going, uh, that does actually boost your sales because folks will stop for a second to say hello. It gives them that extra split second to just sort of like look up at your display and perhaps they see something they missed. This is not a high pressure sales ploy. It's not weird. It's not skeezy. It's polite and it gives somebody a second to see something they might have otherwise missed. Don't feel like you're pushing stuff on anybody because you're not. Um, folks are also generally polite and they don't necessarily want to disturb someone who has their head down and is drawing or looking at their phone. So if at con art is your thing, consider having an assistant who can greet people as they're walking by, say, hey, how's it going? Engage potential clients for you while you are working on work for others. Get yourself an extrovert. Um, and of course, be professional. Avoid uh, vending while intoxicated and or high. You, just, it's not a good call. Don't do it. It's work. Listen to the dealer's den lead. That's it. That's the slide. Listen to them. Selling continued. Uh, if you are vending solo, consider uh, bringing a small cooler with you um, to put drinks and snacks and your lunch because unless you have an excellent dealer's den lead or neighbors who are superb, you may be on your own and you may not be able to steal a moment to go out and get food. And that eight hours can be a very long eight hours if you are hungry. Uh, keep a ledger of your sales and tally them daily. Uh, I personally like to tally uh, cash sales and square sales separately. So I draw a little dollar sign if it's cash and I draw a little square sign if it's through square. Um, the reason for this is because square readers do charge a percent of your, uh, charge a percent on the sale that is made. And this is important for tax filing purposes. So it's a good idea to keep track of both. Separate your float from your cash daily and store your float uh, that shouldn't say store your float, that should say store your extra in a safe, secure location in your hotel room. And again, never leave cash in the dealer's den overnight. If you are selling out super fast, don't tear down your setup because uh, this has happened to me in the past. I used to, you know, as I was selling stuff, I would, I would take, my, take my display down. And what ended up happening is people who clocked my display at the beginning of the con would walk by a day and a half later and they wouldn't be able to find it because they're looking for something that looks completely different than what it is now. So don't tear down your setup as you are selling out of things. Consider taking pictures of the merchandise that you have and putting them up as the item sells out. That way people can see what was in that spot. It's not empty and your display still looks like your display. How to win friends, or at least avoid being a bad neighbor. Do your best not to disturb vendors who are actively setting up or tearing down unless you are offering to help. Do not push your merchandise or your business ventures on other vendors. And when I say that, I mean don't push it. Even if it's a super cool idea, you can talk to people about it, you can mention it, and then I would say ask if they have a business card and you can say, do you have a business card? Can I contact you after the convention um, so we can discuss this further? That's a good way to go about it. Do not put your colleagues on the spot um, or corner them for large chunks of time. If or when somebody asks how your con is going, it is not an invitation to brag about the literal dollar amount that you have made. You have three polite options. It's going rough, it's going okay, it's going pretty well. And then the polite response is asking how their con is doing. It's okay to dis express displeasure if your sales aren't doing well, but if things are going well and it doesn't matter how well, uh, the appropriate response is mild pleasure. It's going really well. Because you don't know if the person who's asking you is having a really awful sales time. So if they're, if they're like not making any sales, you're like, oh, it's doing so great. I made like a thousand grand today. 
it just feels icky as the other person. So just being mindful that things that might be going well for you might not be for someone else and keeping that in mind with your response is important. And count your cash privately after hours. Continuing on, if you have a particularly large setup that may dip into someone else's space or otherwise make uh, getting in behind the tables difficult, if you can, contact them before the convention. Say, hey, um, this is what my table setup usually looks like. Is this okay with you? If they say it's all right, great. If they say it's not, you need to accept it. You need to accommodate them and move on because your space, the space you pay for is your table. It is not the ground next to your table. It is not halfway through the hallway behind you. It is your table and like two or three feet behind it. Never, ever, 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 ever block another vendor's table with your own merchandise. Don't do it. Uh, also avoid playing loud music or any music. Um, it gets very repetitive even though your choice in music is probably superb and the best choice in music possible, your neighbors might have terrible choice in music and they might not like your music and it's just, it's just better that way. Um, if you are conducting a business that's noisy, let's say maybe you're doing glass engraving or something, let the dealer's den lead know ahead of time that you're planning on doing that and check with your neighbors to make sure that they can accommodate that. Some people get headaches really easily and like say glass engraving or whatever for eight hours a day might not be everybody's cup of tea. Um, additionally, if you're selling stuff that smells, has scented products, that's fursuit sprays, soaps, etc., you may want to consider the same thing. Some people get uh, or have migraines triggered by scents, and if that happens to be the person you're sitting next to, you want to make sure that that's not something that they have to deal with at the convention. Also, don't block walkways or gaps or exits between the tables. That is a fire hazard. Don't do it. If your neighbor asks you to stop doing something, you should stop. Um, behind the table space is shared with other vendors, so it is really important that you do not invite or let anyone other than your assistant behind the table. Even if your friends are super cool, which I'm sure they are, and super trustworthy, which I'm sure they are, the other people in that vendor's area do not know them, and it makes other vendors really uncomfortable when a stranger walks behind you. So do not invite someone behind the tables who should not be behind the tables. Keep in mind as well that your fellow vendors are your colleagues. They're not your competition. You should treat them as such. Treat them as colleagues. Don't, don't go trying to like undercut them and stuff. Consider making a code word or a hand gesture for you and your neighbors in case you need help. For example, someone has been chatting with you for 10 or 15 minutes and even though they're, I'm sure they're a wonderful person, you might be like, I really, I, I have to do something else. Can we help? Come up with a code word or like a hand gesture or a sign something so that the other person nearby knows okay hey um do you have a minute sorry um can, can you make change for me just something really quick that's not rude like get out um just something nice so that nobody's insulted nobody's offended just a nice subtle like okay look, okay so packing up pack up as quickly as possible hotels put a strict pack out time um, that the conventions have to adhere to. So uh, don't worry, it does take way less time. Like I said, my setup takes about three hours to set up, three to four. I take less than an hour to tear it all down. Setup is a lot faster. Make sure you dispose of your garbage properly, including all small items that might be scattered on the floor. That can be things like zip ties, paper scraps, extra laminating paper, things like that. It should all go in the garbage. Do a final sweep of your table area before leaving. So that might mean like taking the tablecloth up off the table, making sure there's nothing of yours underneath, things like that. You don't want to forget anything. You certainly don't want to forget anything important. Unless you're in a rush, try and thank your dealer's den lead before you go. They work really hard behind the scenes. It looks easy, but it's not. There's a lot that's going on, a lot of planning, and without them, you wouldn't be there. So it's really important to just take a moment, acknowledge their hard work, say, hey, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Hope to see you next year. It goes a long way. We're almost done here. Um, advice from vendors. Now this is, we have a little vendor chat. Um, and so a couple of folks have contributed to that. So Ink Tiger says, get enough sleep. Do everything you can to make sure you get enough sleep. Snacks, table snacks are a must. You will be trapped there and will be hungry. It does you no favors. Shiara says, have signs you can read in fursuit. 
Plant Panda Art said themes are fun and attractive to customers. Get a fanny pack for your cash, keep your smaller bills towards the front, larger bills to the back. Uh, it's harder to steal a fanny pack than a cash box. Uh, pins, stickers, keychains, buttons, small merchandise are your bread and butter. Don't be discouraged if a con turns you down on your vendor's application. They do see hundreds come through. Just keep building your portfolio and try again. Pirate Artisan says becoming a dealer takes way more energy than you think it does, and you're going to have less time for doing stuff at a con. A lot of folks also get too hung up on decorating their table. Your table is the stage on which your product should shine. Make a good product and make it shoppable first. Worry about the decor second. Caribou Inc. says, engage your customers, say hi, compliment a badge, ask them about their species. Furries like it when they feel like you care. Also, no one con is ever an it con. You can make as much or more at smaller conventions as you can at bigger ones with thousands of other vendors. Build up your table slowly, get the basics you need to display your stuff to begin with. You can make your table move, uh, more memorable as you can afford it over time. Don't be afraid to rebrand your artist's name if needed. Wolfie slash my arm can fly says, if you're going to start a business, take it seriously as a business, even if it's not your full-time gig and it shouldn't be at first. Be prepared to tackle and learn about taxes to work through writing contracts that protect you and your buyers if you take commissions. Way too often I see folks starting to take commissions or selling art because they're good at art, but then they get totally swamped and overwhelmed trying to manage the money. Stabler Cake says, start in the artist alley. This one's actually very good. Consider starting in the artist alley. It's usually free or cheaper. It's smaller and you can leave if you hate it. Focus on your products first, not your table. And Shiva, the dealer's den lead from TFF, says uh, a nicely put together application page. So we are on time. Phew. <laughs> That was a whirlwind, I understand. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And additionally, if something comes to you later, um, I will be in the dealer's den almost all weekend, except for when I'm hosting a couple other panels. So feel free to ask them as well. Do we have questions? You covered everything very thoroughly. Well, thank you. <laughs> Did I? Yeah, yes. I, have a, I got a couple. Sure. Um, okay. How do you make sure you have enough of everything? How do you calculate how much stuff to bring? Oh boy, I'm still figuring that one out. Yeah. Um, that is a lot of trial and error, honestly. Um, Artist Alley is a good place to start. You could talk to other vendors who you have seen in the past. Um, you can gauge just by like taking a look at what is on display. It's probably a good place to start. Um, yeah, I unfortunately don't have a really good solid answer for that. I'm still still working it out and seeing what what works. Artist Alley, good place to start. Yeah, I mean, even if you have an online store, I have I have an online store, and um, I, you can't take those numbers and, and no. correlate them to what's going to possibly sell in not in, at in all vendors conventions. I've never been at a, never been at a furry convention, but I have done a couple markets this past year and. Yeah. It's just out of left field. Of, you know, I, I sell yeah. Kigus and I sell plush props and the Kigus are like the main thing in my shop. And the plush props, I maybe sell like four or five in a month, but when I bring them here, <laughs> it's the plush props that go. Right. So knowing your audience. Also, I would say it is good to have a variety of um, price ranges. So starting off from like things that are between one and five dollars up to your bigger ticket items, having a variety is very helpful. Okay, thank you. No um, problem. Oh, and I have another question too. Sure, go ahead. Okay, um, for the temporary tax ID, because I've heard about this, because I'm from Georgia, where okay. I know they have like a fairgrounds tax thing with their dealers. Is that something you file with the state? Do you have to file that like multiple times a year or just so before the convention? That depends on the state. So for Washington, I have a, like, and it varies by state, so I can't speak to Georgia, but Washington's, uh, their, their temporary tax ID is for this event, and that's it. That's all I will have to file. Texas, it is every quarter. And Nevada, not at all. So it depends, but it is filed with the state versus federally. Okay. Is it also just filed sort of independently, or do you have to include it with other like business taxes? No, it's filed, in, from what I understand, it's filed independently unless you are in that state. I believe it would be different if you are actually running a business out of Georgia. 
Okay. Um, so like I in Texas, I believe that would just be like your full. I'm not 100% sure though. That would be something to look up because it will vary state to state. Okay, that's good to know. No worries. You had a question. I just was going to make a comment you, um, on the table set of other things. Uh, make sure you read the you know, the uh, the actual table list. Or, or on the athlete, because some places will charge for linens, electrical, Wi Fi, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. transaction fee. I mean, the, all the little fees that add up. Yeah. The same. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're lucky on the West Coast. Like, our table fee covers the table. A lot of the West Coast conventions, Wi Fi is included. Um, and a handful of them also include electricity. At different conventions, you can be paying like between 15 to 40, 50, $100 a day for Wi-Fi. And you are also often charged for electricity. So they will have that on their dealers section saying, hey, if you want this, it's this much extra and so on and so forth. But that is something to be sure you know of before you go. Don't count on it. Count on a table. Don't even count on a tablecloth. Sometimes there are not tablecloths. Count on a chair and a table. Anybody else? Yes. Um, so I have another tax related question. Um, if you're vending at a con, um, regardless of where the con is, I, I know that sales tax laws um, vary by state and by country. Um, like I'm from Vancouver and, and we do have to charge sales tax if we have a GST number and everything, regardless of where we're vending. Um, as a general practice, uh, do, you, do you think that it's best to include tax in the prices and doesn't the buyers don't have to worry about it? Or do you charge sales tax um, dependent on like the state? Basically, how is sales tax charged? And does that, as a general practice, come out when you're vending at cons of your pocket, like in quotations, or the, or the customer's pocket after everything is put in? Like basically subtitle versus existing total. Okay, first of all, hey, Vancouver! Let's go! Also Vancouver, woo! Yeah. Um, so, I can answer that one fairly well. When I vend at Vancouver, I have sales tax added to my square reader. So if an item costs $10, uh, after sales tax, it's uh, 12%? It's 12%. Yeah. yeah, so it'll be um, $12. Uh, $12 uh, or $11.20, wouldn't it be? Uh, yeah, $11.20. So it'll be 1120 after tax. And what I'll do is I'll say, all right, it's $12. How would you like to pay? If they say cash, it's $12, or sorry, it's $10. How would you like to pay? If it's cash, it's $10. If it's on card, it's $11.20 after tax. And that's when you say the after tax. Most people will not balk at tax being included after um, after the ticket price because it is standard for most retail places yeah. to have that. So that's just the way I've done it. I haven't had anybody complain about it and be like, oh, that's not fair. Never mind. I'm not going to do it. Um, maybe I've been fortunate. I'm not sure. But so that's what I do is sales taxes extra. Um, depending on where you're going in Reno, they actually do make you, uh, you have to charge sales tax. They're, whew, BLFC is whew, um, very strict on their sales tax. You have to have a little sign on your table if sales tax is included in the price. Otherwise, it is assumed it is not. And you also have to file your sales tax before you go. They collect it and you have to pay them your sales tax before you leave the dealer's room. You cannot leave the dealer's room until you have paid them sales tax. And that lineup can be three hours long. <laughs> But yeah, so uh, for VF and Canadian cons and stuff, uh, I collect the sales tax. Fortunately for me, because most of my sales are done online, um, I don't have, and uh, most of my sales end up going to the US, the amount that I collect in sales tax is usually less than the amount that I get back from my um, uh, tax deductible stuff. But I still keep track of it. Um, and that's very important to do, yeah. So you're just keeping track of it. And then I can't remember, I think I file every, I accidentally filed in August this last year. I was supposed to file in April. So are you Canadian? I am. So you're from Vancouver? I am. So am I. That's oh, so wait. amazing to, to, to oh, yeah, Also Vancouver. Oh, wait. I know. I'm so, like, I'm, so you actually do. See, I, my daughter is, I'm here as a mom trying to learn from my daughter who wants to do this. And I'm gotcha. like, you can't be doing selling things in America. Like, you can't be going to conferences. But you guys make this work. So the cameras are off, right? No. Okay. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> I've just been telling her, forget about it. 
Like it's not gonna happen, but. Um, typically, if you want to be a vendor in the United States, uh, you need to be an American, or you need to have an American that you have hired okay. who sells on your behalf. They're the one handling the money. They're the one you have hired to work. There needs to be a sales contract agreement. Um, that's the best, and you don't bring your merchandise with you across the border. Yeah, it is a impossible. challenge yeah. um, to do that. I would recommend, especially, uh, are we talking young fur, medium fur? She's, oh, she's 18 right now. Okay, I would recommend she starts off at Vancouver. Yeah, that's why um, we'll definitely only do that. Um, Halloween is another good place to start. Um, if she wants to travel a little bit further afield, Furre. What's that one? Uh, Furre. It's in Edmonton. Edmonton. So it's that's what I was hall. thinking. I'm thinking but she like, could do Edmonton and Vancouver, and then that's going to yes. be the end of it. But. Yeah. I, unfortunately, um, those are the main ones that are like drivable. Um, Fernal Equinox is in Toronto. Oh. Um, that's a bit of a longer haul. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I would say definitely start off local for her. Yeah. yeah. See how she likes it. Absolutely. Um, and then figure out the logistics of um, But you guys instance. somehow do make this work somehow. My husband is American. Oh, so I have so a little bit of a, in. Okay. Yeah, okay. I've got a, I, I, I have a guy. Yeah, I've got one. a guy yeah. for that. <laughs> do you sell them in the States? Are there a few guys? No, I used to vent at some of the smaller conventions in Vancouver, but I okay. never crossed the border. And 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 how about you? I was just intimidated by the whole process. I know, it's, it's terrifying. <laughs> it's absolutely I haven't, I haven't terrifying. Done, I haven't done actual vending yet. I, okay. do, I do have kind of complicated taxes because a lot of my business comes from the States. So yeah. I, I do, I do, so do you sell like do Etsy and stuff like that? Um, or or a website? I, 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 I'm a YouTuber, so it's not quite oh, the same. Okay. Okay. Work, but I want to get into vending, so I, I've had to book into laws myself. But Can are Canadians... Friends who vend and they're just like it's a nightmare. It is. Yeah. You have to every single say every single state that you vend then in, you, you have to yeah, do your sales tax there and this. Um, with okay. Seattle, I have applied for my temporary tax ID. Mm -hmm. They sent me the paperwork, they mailed me the form that I need to send back within 10 days of this convention. With it, uh, I have to write a check for that and send it back to them. Mm -hmm. Um a lot of states, as long as they're getting paid. Uh, they're they're okay with it, mm -hmm. as far as I know. <laughs> it's crossed. Don't cross the border with your merchandise. Yeah. That needs to be mailed, and yeah. that way it's sent through a broker. Yeah. So that person is taking care of it. You don't. You don't. If you're crossing the border, you do not tell them that you are selling. You also, yeah. if you're a Canadian, you are not allowed to volunteer in the states. Oh my gosh. So you're not allowed to volunteer. Nope. At the nope. So you're going to a convention to have fun. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, I know the border's a terrible, scary place. Don't post that at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've confessed to a crime. What's that? I've confessed to a crime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah. Oh, something happened. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have another question that I may remember. Uh, mailing merchandise. Yes. Where do you mail it to? Who do you mail it to? That is a superb question. So, for me, I use UPS because FedEx is a little bit more expensive in Canada. UPS will insure for the full amount. Generally speaking, I send it via ground because I don't have air kind of money. Um, so, I will send it by ground depending on where it's going, depends on how long it's going to take to get there. So what I'll usually do is about a month beforehand um, or longer, I would say if this is like your first convention, you're trying to figure out how much time you want to have leading up to the con, how close your margins are gonna be a couple months out. Um, UPS has on their website a shipping calculator. So you can add in your approximate box dimensions and weight where it's going. Excuse me. And it will give you an estimate for the price and how long it will take. So that's a good place to start for that. So like shipping from Vancouver to Seattle takes two days. Shipping from Vancouver to Texas takes five or six. Um, MFF was like seven or eight days. And it's extremely stressful, at least for me, um, because there are a lot of times import fees. Um, if you happen to be shipping uh, internationally, make sure that you watch that tracking really closely because if there are import fees, you're gonna be mailing us to a hotel. It's going to be going to Hyatt Regency, uh, sorry, it'll be going to Human and name redacted. Mm -hmm. uh, care of, so C O, Hyatt Regency Seattle, and then their address. Make sure that your name is on a hotel room reservation because they will cross check that 
And if your name comes up, they're like, oh, okay, this person is staying here, all right, we'll hold the package. However, if there are import fees on that, they will not pay them, and that will get returned to sender. So you want to keep track of the tracking. If there are import fees, it happens. I had it for maybe like 70% of the stuff I mail ends up with them. Or sorry, 30% ends up with them. But it's still a good idea to keep track of because that way you want to make sure it gets there. The last thing you want to do is be on your way to the convention and find out that your merchandise got sent back. Oh, yeah. So keep an eye on the tracking. Uh, to your name, care of where you're staying. A lot of hotels have, like a lot of the fur cons have like a FedEx uh, place. So the ones that don't will still receive your packages. Additionally, I didn't put this in there. Importantly, uh, they do have, um, a lot of hotels will have a holding fee. Mm -hmm. And that can be anywhere between five to about 20 to $30 a package, depending on the size and how much take, uh, space it takes up. So also factor that in, you can call the hotel ahead of time and say, hey, have a package coming just so you know it's going to be approximately the size. What kind of what are your holding fees? So that's an option. Thank you. No I got mail some stuff, and I'm like, I struggle sometimes with having stuff off the mail, so it sounds terrifying to have a bunch of merchandise, but mm -hmm. it sounds way better than. I don't sleep yeah. for anywhere between two to seven days. Yeah. Um, it's unpleasant. Um, I will also add if you are shipping internationally, um, it is a good idea to, like, because I sell fabric and stuff, make sure you put um, what the fabric is made of, polyester or cotton, because that can add um, additional delays with customs. I'm not sure if it holds, has additional delays with just like the general shipping, but with customs, for sure it does. So you want to answer all their questions before they have them. Okay, thank you. No problem. You said the slide was going to be online on board? It will be. Um, so it is currently online. Um, if you, uh, it is on my Patreon. However, I've made it free for everybody. So it will just show up on the Patreon. Um, if you go to my Twitter, there is a link to it, or it is a pox on industries on Patreon. Um, otherwise, my Twitter is a pox on underscore arts, and the link is there. No problem. And again, if you have questions or if you forget where it is and you'd like to look it up, hit me up in the dealer's den and I can absolutely answer those questions for you. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your con. And I will be hosting a business business panel on Sunday and a kingdom making panel tomorrow. Is that what the name of I didn't recognize that name? That's what those are. These are Wendy's or Key Rubies. What's the word you say? Key I've come to this one. Nice. But um yeah, so this is this is one of my favorite this one and for it, honestly. Yeah, we're hoping to do that maybe this year. Um, it's also a gorgeous job. Like if you plan on it. Oh my gosh. It's, yeah. it's long. It's long. I yeah. would recommend perhaps breaking it up two days. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. It's well, that's so cool to hear that, that you guys are from Vancouver and stuff like that. <laughs> I won't keep you. Oh, no. <laughs> Have a good one. Hey, that's great. Well, that's great. Can I follow you on YouTube here? Uh, yeah. You're very welcome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's all, it's oh, all you're awesome. Do you, do you have it here? Well, I don't have it here, but I can't. Okay. Yeah. I, would I, I, take, I would love to take, uh, take pictures. I would love to see pictures if you got them. Oh, heck yeah. It took me like eight months to finally do it, but I figured it out. Hey, you know what? I bought a fabric for a pair of pants a year and a half ago, and it's still sitting in my sewing pile. I hear you. Yeah, no, that's a lot of my I hear that too. It just gets tossed inside. Like, ah, oh, we'll yeah. do it eventually. Eventually, I'll have time. This year, I did seven conventions, so I didn't have a lot of time. I think I have aged myself a decade in this last year. Yeah, I, I hear you on that one. <laughs> for totally different reasons, but I hear you on that. Um, I have one one question for you, which sure. is, I, um, I was told that you do custom figures. Yes. How much do they, they start they at? They start at 500 US, go up based on complexity. I'm closed at the moment. I yeah. may be opening in the summer. I'm not sure. I took a year off just because I was really burnt out. Oh, I don't blame you. And it felt really good. And between like the chaos of this year, I'm kind of like, 
I don't know if I want to do it anymore. <laughs> no, I get that. So I'm, I'm getting into suit making right now. And I'm like, with everything else I put, I just want to do that for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because 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 sometimes like you need an outlet for yourself still. Yeah, exactly. Like and and, and I, I don't I don't want to turn fursuits into work. I want that to be something that I enjoy. You gotta right have now, something for fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, right now video games are work to me because I because I make. Yeah, you do YouTube videos. Yeah, I do YouTube. But luckily, most of my YouTube videos are not gaming related, but all of my Twitch streams are. So I associate video games with work a lot of the time, right? This is like. Oh. Not quite as fun. Like, yeah. No, it isn't. Like, so you play it for work and such. Like, yeah. 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 Exactly. I mean, like the thing is, I still, I still love my job. Like, it's, it's really fun. But it, it becomes the whole thing of like, I have to do moderation now. I can't just do it when I want to, because then it just starts to feel like work, and then it burns, burns you out. You know? Yeah. But yeah. Exactly. Either way, this is a great panel. I loved it, and I love your figures as well. You're not I, 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 I do want to see you at some other concert. I'll be Thank you for yeah. Uh, it's for an equinox, and then I have a little break, and I'm hoping to go to Furry. You're going back to back to...